Real quickly, let me tell you what inspired this project. It was this dress, which I saw worn by Rebecca, who goes by a clothes horse on Instagram. I loved it by itself, but I especially loved how she sometimes wears it as a blouse, with skirts. It just had so many whimsical little details that I loved, and seemed like such a practical, versatile dress. My first thought was to collect reference photos and see if I could recreate the fabric design and have it custom printed. Then I did a little bit more research and found that the dress was made by Samantha Pleat, and the print is her illuminated design, and custom fabric is sort of her thing. It was a little over the copyright line for me. I mean, I still have no problem if you want to do that for personal use, but if I did it, it wouldn't be personal use because I have a channel. So I let the project idea die, until a few months ago when I saw this fabric on Mood. It's not the same, but it struck such a similar vibe with whimsical foresty details and bold colors on ivory. It was the same in every way that mattered to me. So I bought two and a half yards, and here we go. Looking at the photos I was able to find of the original, the construction appears to be a princess-themed dress. It is quite short. I'll probably add a few inches to the hem. It does have pockets, and they appear to be built into the side front panels of the dress. The collar is a bit weird. It looks like a narrow standing collar, but with the front edges curved like a Peter Pan collar and overlapped. The sleeves are three-quarter length. They have a few gathers at the shoulder, and more like ease stitches rather than gathers into the cuff. The cuff also looks to me to be curved and overlapped, like the collar. The dress zips up in the back, and it definitely looks like the seams are top-stitched. Sorry for the blurry reference photos, but the main challenge here was that I could barely find any pictures that weren't tiny. So yeah, this is basically what I'm going with. A pattern as close to the original as possible, but with a bit more length. And why am I trying so hard to copy it with a totally different fabric? Because it's fun. To make this pattern, I first have to convert my basic bodice block into a princess seamed bodice. This turned out to be a lot simpler than I was imagining. You simply copy your block onto new paper, extend the dart lines to the apex, cut out the darts, then move the side dart up into the armhole. Now it basically is a princess seam, just squared. I cut the acute angle into a curve and then used that scrap to curve out the obtuse angle on the center front piece. That was basically all there was to it. Repeat that on the back piece, but since it only has one vertical dart to begin with, I had to split some of that dart fullness away into a new dart at the armhole. Round the curves, add seam allowance, and I have a basic princess seamed bodice. However, I soon realized that mocking up this bodice was super important. It fit well enough as a base, but it was nowhere near perfect. I needed to add to the bust. It was very tight. But then beneath the bust and approaching the waist, the seam was way too loose. I'm not sure how the physics of that all work, since I was starting from a nearly perfect block pattern, but it might be because extending the dart legs to the apex takes away a bit of the fabric that would otherwise give room to the bust. It took a couple more tries and a couple edits to get the bodice fitting how I wanted, but in the end it was a simple enough process and I'm very happy with the result. Now I just have to make it into a dress. At first I was thinking I'd freehand out a skirt, but I kept thinking that there has to be a logical, mathematical way to do these pieces so that they're all basically matched. I decided to use angles. I grabbed my half circle skirt pattern that I made a few videos back. My math is, this half circle skirt is meant to be cut into four panels, left and right, front and back. But this princess seamed bodice is technically made from eight panels. So if I use the 45 degree angle of this half circle, then my princess seamed dress should have a full circle skirt. This would have been great, but the problem is that I only have two and a half yards of fabric, and it already gone out of stock. So I had no room for mistakes, and princess seams take up a lot of fabric, especially fabric with one-way designs. I realized I wasn't going to have nearly enough fabric for such a big skirt, so I went down to my quarter circle skirt pattern and used a 22.5 degree angle instead. It angles out from a straight edge on the center pieces, and it angles out straight from the center on the side pieces. Then I just rounded the joint at the waist, and there we go. So here's my base pattern for a princess seamed dress, but there's one detail I'm still missing, the pockets. Here's how I patterned those. Usually, when I set a pocket into a skirt, I place it about three and a half inches below the waistline. I still have the waist markings from the original bodice on my pattern, so I measured three and a half inches down and drew a line. This will be the opening, but how deep should I make it? Well, I figured I'd measure the width of the top and make it at least that deep. A pocket wider than it is deep seemed weird. This will make for a nice big pocket. Now, I essentially need to split this into three pattern pieces. The lower portion plus the pocket, 
the upper portion plus the pocket, and then just the pocket for a lining. Make sure these new pieces all have proper seam allowance, and add a little bit more to the top of the skirt piece, because that will need to be rolled into a hem. And now, the dress is ready to begin. I haven't done any patterning for the sleeves or the collar yet, but that's because I don't feel like it. We'll come back to them later. For now, we can get the main dress cut out and started. First thing that needs sewn are the pockets. This is a complicated little string of steps, but they're all easy. <laughs> Let's do the bodice portion first. Line up the bottoms and then pin them together. Stitch and finish the edge. You can finish the edges any way you want, but I'm going to use my serger for most of the finishing on this project. Now we can add the skirt portion of the pattern and then invert them. I'm going to pin these edges together, but notice that the pocket lining is placed about three quarters of an inch from the edge of the skirt. I could have simplified the pattern and just made these edges match, but then I would have been rolling two layers. Over at the ironing board, I folded the skirt edge down by a quarter inch, then a half, to make a narrow little pocket hem. I pinned it so that the pocket edge was encapsulated by the hem. If you are a newer sewer, I would recommend basting the pocket first, so that it's held into position better. Though it might have only been difficult for me because the fabric was a bit satiny and a bit shifty. If you notice that I'm keeping my pins way closer together on this project, that's why. I stitched the hem and then laid out the panels and lined up all of the edges. I pinned down the sides and basted everything into place, and this side front can now be treated as one piece. And now is the fun part. The reason I love and have missed making princess seam dresses. They come together so quickly. There's no complicated, messy waist seam to deal with. All of the panels just need stitched together. I do find the results are better if I start stitching from the top on every seam, rather than some at the top and some at the bottom of the skirt. This way, if anything shifts or was cut unevenly, at least it will all shift in the same direction and spill over at the bottom, not the top. And I'm going to leave all of these edges unfinished for now, until I can do a fitting. The other reason I love princess seam dresses is that you can insert the zipper much earlier in the project, which makes adjusting the fit so much easier. To do this, I'm going to finish the center back edges on the serger first. It will be much easier than trying to serge once the zipper is already in. I'm going to be using up a lurid canary yellow zipper from my stash. It doesn't match at all, but eh, who cares. To mark the back seam, I lined up the edges and then measured the length of the zipper. At the base, I pinned the center back seam together, and then I pinned between that point and the hem. This seam was stitched together, and I made sure to back tack at the top. Next, a standard invisible zipper insertion. I lined up the edges of the zipper with the seam allowance, pinned it, then used a quick running stitch to base the zipper sides into place. I had to pull out my clunky modern machine because, unfortunately, the centenarian is not compatible with my invisible zipper foot. There was a slight gap when I zipped it up, which usually happens with invisible zippers. Sometimes I try to fold the zipper out of the way and extend the back seam up a half inch or so, but this time it was just not happiness, so I hand stitched that little bitch. <laughs> so I hand stitched that little bit with a small back stitch. With the zipper finished, I just need to do the shoulder seams before I can try it on. I left these for last because it just made the whole thing easier to work with while I got the zipper finished. 
I stitched these shoulder seams and then decided that the edges should be ironed open and each side serged individually, which means that it would have been slightly easier to serge them first. Okay, now I can try it on. Okay, here's what we got so far. The fabric, as much of a pain as but it is to work with, it's very like comfortable and light and swooshy, so I'm happy with that. Um, for the fit, it's it's actually it's good, but I think that that extra quarter of an inch I added for ease, it almost feels unnecessary. I don't want to make it too tight, but I also don't want it to be you know too loose. And right now it feels a little bit too loose, so I'm thinking what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in the sides that extra quarter of an inch. Okay, brought in those seams and it fits much more smoothly along the waist and it's not too tight, not even remotely. And actually that's one of the great things about princess seam dresses is since they don't have a waist seam that really tightens it up, they're just very comfortable in general. So I am very happy with it and I'm going to go ahead and finish all the inside seams. You may have noticed that I'm being a little bit more loose and flippant with this project than usual. Usually I would avoid my serger, and usually I would have gone out and bought a color match zipper. Here's the thing. I feel like a lot of my projects have a thesis or a theory I'm testing out. With this one, I was trying to figure out why so many of the dresses I make for daily wear I end up not wearing very often, and they end up in my dressy casual category by default. I realized that it has almost nothing to do with how nice or fancy the clothing looks, it comes down to how much I have invested in that piece, in terms of material cost and especially time. The reason I hesitate to wear my casual dresses casually is because so much work went into making them that actually wearing them isn't worth the risk of spilling something on the bodice or getting chicken mud on the skirt. I have a predilection for fine fabrics and lovely hand finishings, but even though making such garments is very personally satisfying, it's actually counterproductive to my goal of wearing a home sewn wardrobe. So problem identified, but what's the solution? I decided that I need to be more intentional with planning my projects. Is a dress meant to be casual or saved for special occasions? The intent should determine the construction methods I choose. I have got to tell myself that it's okay to take shortcuts and speed up production time a little. The solution is to minimize my personal investment in casual clothing projects so that I'm willing to grab them on a casual day without that little tinge in my mind saying that this dress is too valuable to risk. So with this dress, I am simply serging the inside edges to finish them. However, once each seam is serged, I'm going to iron it down and top stitch it. I'm doing this because the original dress did it, but also because this will keep the seams in place. You know how annoying I find it? Seams twisting around inside a dress, particularly a princess seam dress like this with very long curved seams. This is a simple, quick way to hold them in position. It will be durable for washings, and I won't have to re-iron the seams every time I do wash it. Now, back to patterning, for I need a sleeve. I basically started with a random sleeve from a random big box pattern. I traced it out as a reference, but then I ended up changing basically everything about it. I measured the finished armhole seams of the four dress pattern pieces. I came up with just shy of 16 inches. Then when I measured the corresponding finished seam on the sleeve, I came up with roughly 20 inches, which meant that four whole inches were going to need to gather down into the sleeve cap. The original dress does have some gathers, but this just seemed like way too much. So I measured out and sketched a cap that would finish at roughly 16 inches, and then freehanded a cap somewhere in between. Then, of course, this isn't a three-quarter length pattern, so I needed to extend it out. It looked alright to me, so I made a mock-up and stitched that right onto the dress. Oh, and I forgot, that's actually why I didn't make a sleeve pattern earlier. I wanted to see how it fit on the actual dress and didn't feel like making a whole mock-up just for that. Okay, here's how the mock-up turned out. Not too bad. Um, I think I am going to widen it a little bit. Like, it looks loose enough, but when I'm kind of moving my arm around, it tightens up a bit. I might also lengthen it by about an inch. Uh, keep in mind that it will have a cuff, but also have to be moved up half inch for the seam allowance. Yeah, I think I'm gonna add about an inch to it. I don't want it to be like awkwardly lengthed. I want it to be a solid three-quarter length. You know, okay, another thing. All right, so I trimmed this edge in a couple of different times just because I didn't, it felt uncomfortable the way things kept cutting into my shoulder. 
it comes in kind of far here, but then it goes wide, right back out wide to the shoulders. Yeah, see it kind of comes out wide again back here, but then slopes more towards the tip of the shoulder at, at the top. <sighs> yeah, that looks a little weird to me. Okay, however, if I do adjust this, then I'm probably going to need to add some more back onto the sleeve cap. Uh, so, yeah. I don't really know, making it up as I go. I lined up the two pattern pieces at the shoulder, and then, as I suspected, they did dip back out. So I used the French curve ruler to bring the shoulder in some and straighten the seam out. Okay, here it is. Lengthened, widened down the center so that the extra bulk goes in between the shoulders instead of off to the sides or anything weird. Um, I lengthened the shoulder cap back out just a little bit to match up with the uh, adjusted shoulders on the bodice pattern, and I'm just going to cut this out. I'm pretty darn confident in it. That confidence was only slightly misplaced, but we'll get there later. I cut the sleeves out, and boy, is two and a half yards just barely going to make it. I pinned and sewed down the length of the sleeves, and then while I was at it, I sewed gathering stitches around the sleeve cuff and cap. I serged the sleeve seams as one, but I slightly wished that I'd serged them individually before sewing, so that I could have ironed them open. I just didn't feel like trying to open the seam and serge each side individually, not with this shifty fabric threatening to sneak up underneath and get itself chopped. It's a small thing, though. Then I set the sleeves in the armholes, which is the most annoying part of most projects, and unfortunately I don't have many helpful hints. Maybe that if you are a new sewer and intimidated by this, hand sew it first, just a simple running stitch to baste them. The wonderful thing about hand sewing is how much control it gives you over your stitching. It's kind of like walking down a hill versus skateboarding. If you have the skills, you might make a mistake, but you'll probably be fine. But if you're a newbie and don't think you can make it without hurting yourself, it is okay to walk. Alright, so I still haven't made the cuff pattern yet. I like the level of gathers that just running a gather stitch gave the sleeve, so I'm not going to worry about gathering them further. I just measured them and transferred that to paper. I'm going to cut the cuffs wide enough to fold back up over themselves, and I'm making sure to add an extra inch to the length for that crossed over part. Use the French curve to make the little round ends, add seam allowance, and we're going to cut it out. I did forget myself and flip the pattern upside down for the second pair, which you shouldn't do on a one-way design like this. However, that actually works for the best, because I can use the upside down ones for the cuff linings, and when the cuffs are turned up, that is the part that will show and also be turned up. Serendipity. I'm going to interface the cuff liners. Lately I've been using a cotton fusible interfacing instead of webbing, and I really like it. It seems to do a better job adhering to the fabric, it stays stuck, it doesn't bubble up, it has a gentle but crisp structure. I think I'm sticking with it from now on. So, the cuffs can be pinned right sides together and then sewn around three sides, with the base left open. Then the cuffs need to be turned. I trimmed the seam allowance down by about half, and then I clipped around the curves. Something else I've started doing recently is cutting tiny triangles out of the curve instead of simply clipping into it. It's a small thing, but I think that it elevates your sewing, just by a little. Instead of those clipped pieces folding and bulky and layering over each other when you turn it, they fit smoothly inside. I pinned those open edges together and then basted them. I also decided while I was at it to sew a top stitch around the whole cuff. It will hold everything together better, and this project already has a ton of top stitching, so it's not like it's going to stand out. I considered all manner of methods that I could use to attach these cuffs to the sleeve, most of which involved hand stitching, but that little overlap was a problem. In the end, I decided to use the simplest, fastest method, and I don't regret it at all. I just pinned the cuff to each sleeve, sewed all the way around them, surged away the nasty, and then turned that edge to the inside of the sleeve. I ironed it, then top stitched it. Easy. And here's why I don't regret it. I then folded the cuff up and ironed it into a new shape, which happened to cover the base of the sleeve. So even if I had used felling or slip stitch to finish everything neatly inside and avoid that top stitch, it would have still been covered up. 
I'm telling you, sometimes you've just got to reel yourself in and lower your personal investment in a project. It's not helping as much as you feel like it is. And hey, guess what? I finished the pattern and cutting out on a previous day, but all of this sewing was done in one day. I'm down to just the collar and the hem now, but even having most of a dress finished in one day is a huge improvement for me. <laughs> for the collar, I apologize for not filming the patterning, but I honestly had no idea how I was going to pattern it, and it was late at night, so I just figured I'd take a whack at it. And it worked out pretty well. <laughs> Basically, I measured the finished neckline edges of the dress front and back, then drafted a collar around the French curve to match the sum of those measurements. I added a half inch at the front for that overlap, added seam allowance, and that was pretty much it. The next morning I made a mock-up collar, and it looked pretty good on the mannequin, but I also pinned it to the neckline of the dress to make sure that it fit there too. It was maybe a touch tight, but not enough for me to bother with correcting it. I cut out four from my dwindling fabric. I love it when a project runs so close to your fabric that you almost run out, but you don't have to piece things then you don't have to worry about what to do with the leftovers. I also cut two pieces of cotton interfacing and bonded it to the pieces I decided should be the face side. The collar was patterned and constructed much like the cuffs. I pinned them right sides together, sewed around three sides, trimmed and clipped the seams, turned them right side out, ironed them smooth, then top stitched to hold everything in place. Now they are neatly finished and ready to go on the dress. I marked the center front of the dress with a pin and overlapped the collar fronts by a half inch on each side. I pinned them around the neckline, sewed them down, then serged the raw edge. I used a fat needle to bury the tail of the serging and then ironed the neckline. I top stitched to hold that seam in place, just like I did with the cuffs. To make sure the back stays folded down properly despite the split, I pinned the top edge of the collar in place and then took it to the machine and sewed right over the previous top stitching, making an inch long tack. Yes, this would have been less visible if I'd done it by hand, but lower personal investment. I ironed the collar into shape and do you see how the overlapped front causes the layers to hang unevenly? A nice little detail, just like the original. I also sewed a hook and eye onto the inner fold of the collar, just to hold the back together and keep it from gaping. Last thing, the hem. Since most of these seams were cut on different angles, I hung the dress up overnight to see if the hem would stretch itself out any. I have this tool, which is supposed to blow chalk and let you stand up straight and mark a hem on yourself. It wasn't working great, so I ended up switching the dress to my mannequin and marking the hem myself. The mannequin doesn't exactly reflect my body type, but you know, it's close enough. So, how did it turn out? Well, there are three different metrics. How close did I come to the original? Actually, pretty close. The skirt drapes correctly, the pockets hang right, the collar and cuffs are a bit too wide, the collar is definitely different. The original seems to be narrower and is shaped more like a straight collar instead of the curve I added. But here's the thing. I like mine better. <laughs> I love my collar and how it looks kind of like a traditional standing collar but with a little bit of a twist. But the essence of the dress, the thing that drew me to it, the combination of factors that make it so ultra-versatile, all of those translated perfectly. The color palette is great. There are so many colors present that it pairs well with almost anything. 
and the print is big enough that all of those colors don't just melt together. They're distinct, even from a distance. So what are my critiques of the piece on its own? I do have a few, but not that many. The sleeves are probably two whole inches too short. I was trying to avoid them ending at an awkward length, but that's exactly how they turned out. They sort of get like caught on my elbow when I bend my arms. They definitely don't look three quarter length. I like to push the sleeves up over my elbow, but the cuff would probably need to be about a quarter inch or so shorter for them to stay in place. And then remember how the armhole dipped out weirdly at the shoulder? Well, I did the exact opposite of what I should have done to correct it. Instead of cutting away more from the shoulder, I should have added to the curved pieces in the front and back, because now the seam comes noticeably too far in at the top of my shoulder. But that's actually it. That's all I can really even come up with to complain about. So that's a pretty good success in my book. And finally, how did I do in terms of lowering my personal investment and making a wearable dress? I did so much better. <laughs> Honestly, I got such a sense of relief from this project. I consciously chose easier, less complicated construction methods wherever I could, and the whole project was so much more enjoyable and so much less stressful. In the end, none of the finer finishing methods I was tempted to use would have made any visible difference in the final piece. The methods I used are strong and durable. I've worn the dress several times already, and I don't have nearly as much of a feeling of caution or hesitancy about wearing it. I have not yet worn it on a day when I was just working from home, but I think that's mostly due to the weather. It's high summer now, and this dress is a little bit too covering for me for 90 degree weather. However, compare it to the striped dress I made last, which is more suitable for heat, but do you remember all of that fine finishing I did on the inside? I've only worn that dress once so far. So I think I have solved a mystery and learned a better strategy for future daily wear clothing projects. So yeah, it's a light, comfortable, flowing, feminine dress. It can be dressed up or dressed down, and I can't wait to wear it this fall. The fabric went out of stock soon after I purchased, but looking it up again for the video, I found that it is back in stock. For the cost breakdown of this project, I bought my fabric during a sale, so it was down to $15.59 per yard. I bought two and a half yards, and shipping was free, but with tax it ended up totaling about $41.50. I used interfacing, a zipper, a hook and eye, and thread, all from my existing stash. So yeah, the dress was about 40 bucks. Not too bad. The pattern for this dress will be size graded and up on my Patreon in a week or so. See you next time.